Lakshadweep, new laws calculated effort to alter habits of people evolved over generations. Changing land laws and bringing in outside corporates could change the very character of fragile Lakshadweep. The new laws recently brought about in the Union territory of Lakshadweep were a calculated attempt to alter the habits of people evolved over generations, residents of the Arabian Sea archipelago have said. The administrator of the islands, Prefal Kota Patel, has introduced a number of legislations since February including the Lakshadweep Animal Preservation Regulation, the Lakshadweep Development Authority Regulation, the Prevention of Antisocial Activities Regulation and the Lakshadweep Panchayat Regulation. These have been criticized. Many islanders fear will they permanently alter their culture if implemented. P.P. Muhammad Faisal, who represents Lakshadweep in Lok Sabha, claimed. The present administrator has launched an outright attack on the land rights of the local community. The draft Lakshadweep Development Authority regulation would cause removal or relocation of people from their property for town planning or other developmental activities. If he does so, it will adversely impact the livelihood of the tiny fishing community. What is happening here is a calculated effort to alter the habits of people evolved over generations, he added. Patel had already stopped non-vegetarian items in the midday meals for school children and in government-run hostels. He was also banning the slaughter of cattle, transportation, selling and buying of beef. Faisal alleged. Alcohol sale has been prohibited in the islands, given the religious and cultural sensibilities of the local community. At present, permits for the sale of liquor are getting issued in four islands in the name of promoting large-scale tourism activities. The existing Panchayat law is now getting amended to prohibit anyone with more than two children from contesting elections, an apparent move against Muslims. This again is motivated by the stereotype of Muslims having more than two children. There were also attempts to cut off the traditional trade links of the islands with Kerala. Ships from the islands used to take cargo to Begipura port in Kojikode district. Now, orders have been issued to divert such transit ships to the Mangalore port in Karnataka, he said. Action and Reaction Patel was the Home Minister of Gujarat under then-Chief Minister Narendra Modi in 2012. He is the first politician since 1947 to be appointed Administrator of Lakshadweep. His predecessors were all civil servants. Among the most powerful and damaging could be the draft Lakshadweep Development Authority Regulation 2021. It provides for the development of townships as well as acquisition, alteration, and transfer of landed properties owned by Lakshadweep residents. Smita P. Kumar is an educationist and writer who taught in Lakshadweep for a long time. She said Patel's plans to facilitate mindless tourism by allowing substantial private investment and corporate operations would negatively impact the archipelago's fragile environment and livelihood. Kumar said. Large-scale developmental activities like coastal constructions, Huge ship traffic, beachside resort tourism and beachside fishing will cause large-scale livelihood pressures on the local community. The islands require responsible tourism, which is minimum and reasonable with keeping larger interests of the local community in mind. Another legislation that is in the throes of a controversy is the Lakshadweep Animal Preservation Regulation, 2021. It bans cow slaughter in addition to the buying, selling, transportation or storing of beef or beef products in any form. In addition, non-vegetarian food has been removed from school midday meals and hostel dining halls. We want to preserve milch cows, Lakshadweep collector S. Asker Ali told the website The Print. But, his words ring hollow as Lakshadweep is an overwhelmingly Muslim society. Critics have said the laws have been brought because of old prejudices regarding Muslims among people of a Bharatiya Janata Peri background like Patel. Kochi-based conservation activist and environmental lawyer Harish Vasudevan also points to something else. The islanders' precarious livelihood and the diverse ecosystems of which they are a part need official recognition rather than altering the midday meal menu of local schools and enforcing a ban on cow slaughter. Now, there are attempts to prevent people from rearing cows for milk and meat. This, even as Gujarat's cooperative giant Amal is attempting to take sole control of all milk-related needs of the islands. Ali Akbar is a resident of Kavarati, the capital of the Union Territory. He said the administration's decision to close down dairy farms and open amyl outlets can be seen as part of a larger plan to alter the food and living choices of the local community altogether and to facilitate the entry of dominant players from outside into the hitherto small economy of the islands.
Akbar said the present controversial actions of the administrator were just a cover-up to the unilateral tourism plan, which would ultimately destroy the very identity of the islanders. He said efforts were already on to implement a large tourism project involving the construction of beach and water villas with 370 rooms. The project has been mooted by NITIIG and the Union Ministry of Home Affairs, reportedly under pressure from corporates. Last January, 114 scientists hailing from over 30 universities and research institutes across the country had urged the Union Territory Administration to abandon the controversial project, keeping in view of the possible ecological impact it would have on the region's highly fragile lagoons and beaches. The introduction of liquor and large-scale tourism could have large-scale social and environmental impacts. The islands face waste disposal as a significant problem, affecting the water quality. Tourism has increased the presence of microplastics in the seawater, affecting fish health. More tourism will ensure more such disasters, warn conservationists. A fragile paradise. The political controversy comes even as the fragile archipelago has had to deal with a number of natural disasters recently. The Union Territory located about 200 kilometers from the west coast of Kerala in the Arabian Sea, comprises 16 atolls and 32 islands. However, human presence is limited only to 11 islands. All the islands are northeast-southwest in orientation, and they are characterized by shallow lagoons on the west and steep reef slopes on the east. These peculiarities provide a perfect haven for several marine flora and fauna. The island's water bodies are accommodating rich seagrass beds and algal and coral communities. They provide a haven for various fish species, invertebrates, sea turtles, elasmobranchs and marine mammals. The density of the human population in Lakshadweep, unlike other states and union territories, is also significantly less than the national average. But, in recent years, the fragile archipelago had faced significant climate change-related disasters. In 2017, Cyclone Akai had caused large-scale destruction. Now, during every, southwest, monsoon, surging storms damage the islands. Large-scale coral bleaching events reported in 2013 and 2016 are another threat the islands face in the environmental sector. On May 31, 2021, the Legislative Assembly of Kerala, the state with which the archipelago's residents share ancestral and cultural links, unanimously passed a resolution. It demanded Patel's recall and requested the immediate intervention of the centre to protect the lives and livelihood of the islanders. Cyclone Yes is the 96th tropical cyclone to strike Odisha in 130 years. Balasur was the site for landfall for 28 cyclones in that period. Cyclone Yes is the 96th tropical cyclone to strike Odisha. Photo Ashis Senopti. The severe cyclonic storm Yas, which made landfall in Odisha's Balasur district on the morning of May 26, 2021, is the latest of the 96 tropical cyclones to hit the state in 130 years. As many as 541 tropical cyclones formed in the Bay of Bengal during the period, according to a study. Balasur has been the site of landfall for 28 cyclones between 1891 and 2021, including Yas the highest for a district in Odisha. It is followed by Puri and Jagat Singhpur, 20 each, Ganjam, 13, Kendrapada, 11, and Budruk, 9, districts, said Pratap Kumar Mohanty, Professor, Marine Science, Birhampur University. Mohanty has extensively studied the annual frequency of tropical cyclones over the North India Ocean basins and their intensities. As many 73 cyclonic storms and 23 severe cyclonic storms made landfall in Odisha during this period. Most of the cyclones, 126, were formed in November, followed by October, 94, May, 64, including Yas, and December, 52. Nearly 35 percent of all the cyclonic storms that have crossed the eastern coast of India have affected Odisha and the associated storm surges have often inundated large tracts of coastal districts, said Odisha Economic Survey Report, 2018-19. It added, There are two peaks of tropical cyclones in the Bay of Bengal the primary peak, October-December, and secondary peak, April-June. There has been a significant reduction in the number of tropical cyclones in a year over the North Indian Ocean Basin between 1951 and 2018. 
but the frequency of very severe cyclonic storms during the post-monsoon season has increased significantly in the last two decades. Despite a decreasing trend, the region still remains prone to extremely severe cyclones, said Union Minister of Science and Technology Harshvardhan told the Lok Sava March 2021. On an average, three to four out of five cyclones developing in the North Indian Ocean region make a landfall, causing loss of life and property. Low-lying coastal belts of West Bengal, Odisha, Andhra Pradesh, Tamil Nadu and Puducherry are more prone to the impact of these systems, he had said. In 2020, four of the five cyclones in the region made landfall over the Indian coast, killing 113 persons. In 2019, two of the eight cyclones made landfall and killed 105 persons. In 2018, three of the seven cyclones made landfall, killing 131 persons. In 2017, none of the three cyclones made the landfall. In 2016, only one of the four made landfall, killing six persons. Though the very severe cyclone Akai in 2017 did not cross the coast, it claimed the lives of more than 200 fishers out in the sea, the minister said. Curiously high levels of mercury found in rivers linked to Greenland ice sheet. The findings shine a new light on our understanding of mercury management and the impact of global warming. Curiously high levels of mercury found in rivers linked to Greenland ice sheet. Photo, Kitty Ter Wolbeck slash Wikimedia Commons. High concentrations of mercury, a naturally occurring toxic metal, were found in the water bodies fed by the Greenland ice sheet, according to a recent research. The mercury content in the rivers and fjords of southwestern Greenland was similar to that found in the polluted inland rives of China, the scientists observed. The large volumes of the metal can find its way into the coastal food webs through bioaccumulation and impact the Arctic ecosystem, the paper published in Nature Geoscience said. Greenland is a major seafood exporter. The researchers collected water samples from three rivers and two fjords connected to the ice sheet and found almost ten times the volume of mercury than normal rivers. The Florida State University, which led the research, said in a press brief, Typical dissolved mercury content in rivers are about 1 to 10 ngl1, the equivalent of a salt grain-sized amount of mercury in an Olympic swimming pool of water. In the glacier meltwater rivers sampled in Greenland, Scientists found dissolved mercury levels in excess of 150 ngl1, far higher than an average river. Particulate mercury carried by glacial flour, the sediment that makes glacial rivers look milky, was found in very high concentrations of more than 2,000 ngl1. The toxins did not end up in the meltwaters from industries or other anthropogenic activities, as is the case with most contaminants. Mercury-rich bedrock is weathered during the slow movement of glaciers down the slope of hills and the ground particles are carried into the streams as the glacier melts. The research will set off changes in the way mercury is managed globally, the authors predicted. John Hawkins, a postdoctoral researcher at Florida State University and in the German Research Center for Geosciences, who led the study, said. All the efforts to manage mercury thus far have come from the idea that the increasing concentrations we have been seeing across the Earth system come primarily from direct anthropogenic activity, like industry. But mercury coming from climatically sensitive environments like glaciers could be a source that is much more difficult to manage. Water pollution caused similarly can be heightened as the Earth continues to heat up and ice sheets and glaciers melt faster than ever before. The findings, thus, open a new chapter in understanding the impacts of global warming. The discovery that glaciers may also carry potential toxins unveils a concerning dimension to how they influence water quality in downstream communities, which may alter in a warming world, said glaciologist Gemma Wadham, a professor at the University of Bristol's Cabot Institute for the Environment, an author of the paper. The findings strengthen a growing body of research that dismisses the conception that glaciers have little or no influence on the Earth's geochemical and biological processes, the paper highlighted. NGT upholds rights of pastoralists in Banai grasslands, wants encroachments removed. The court highlighted the lack of coordination between revenue and forest departments for the problem. NGT upholds rights of pastoralists in Banai, wants encroachments removed. Photo, Wikimedia Commons. The National Green Tribunal, NGT, ordered all encroachments to be removed from Gujarat's Banai grasslands within six months and directed a joint commit to prepare an action plan in a month. The region's nomadic pastoralist community, the Maldharis, 
whose livelihoods are depend on this protected shrub savanna, welcomed the move. The community, united under Banai Pashu Ukharak Maldhari Singh Than, Pums, had filed a case against the rampant encroachment in the ecologically sensitive grassland in May, 2018. Banai Ko Banai Reni Du, let Banai remain Banai, echoed pastoralists from the Banai grasslands during the virtual hearing. The panel comprising the Divisional Commissioner and the Chief Conservator of Forest of Kutch will define the extent of the encroachments and an action plan to remove them in the report, the court mandated. The court also said the Maldharis will continue to hold the right to conserve the community forests in the area, granted to them as per the provisions in Section 3 of Forest Rights Act, 2006. NGT highlighted that the lack of coordination between the Forest Department and the Revenue Department lead to the problem of encroachment. The court has brought relief to our community members, added Kakan Mutwe, a Maldhari from Abyanga village, Banai. The directives were welcomed by the Maldhari community who breed Banai buffaloes, a species endemic to the region. The buffaloes are adaptive to Kutch's hot weather condition and yields 12 to 18 liters milk a day, they claim. This judgment is not only important for our survival but for the Banai buffalo, who are asset to us and to the environment, a Fakir Mamad Jot a local livestock farmer. This buffalo breed survives by feeding on the grassland. Banai grassland is spread over 2,618 km and account for almost 45% of the pastures in Gujarat. It comprises 48 hamlets slash villages organized into 19 panchayats, with a population of about 40,000. Two ecosystems, wetlands, and grasslands, are juxtaposed in Banai. The area is rich in flora and fauna, with 192 species of plants, 262 species of birds, several species of mammals, reptiles, and amphibians. Banai grasslands, traditionally, were managed following a system of rotational grazing. On May 11, 1955, the court notified that the grassland will be a reserve forest. On July 3, 2019, the tribunal ordered to demarcate the boundaries of the Banai grassland and restricted non-forest activities. In 2019, the court had heard us but on ground things didn't change, but this time we would remain positive, if things don't change, our fight shall continue, a Nirmadad Jot, a Maldhari member pointed out. Monsoon reaches Bay of Bengal, Kerala onset on May 31, IMD. The intense cyclonic activities over the Bay of Bengal and Arabian Sea might influence the monsoon system. Monsoon reaches Bay of Bengal, Kerala onset on May 31, IMD. The southwest monsoon season advanced into South Bay of Bengal, Andaman Sea and Nicobar Islands on May 21, 2021, a day before its normal date of arrival, according to the India Meteorological Department, IMD. The prediction is in line with the weather agency's May 14 long-range forecast that monsoon winds might bring rainfall over Kerala from May 31, a day before the normal date for onset on June 1. There are chances that the monsoon system might get affected by the intense cyclonic activity in both the Arabian Sea and the Bay of Bengal in the days leading up to the beginning of the season. Cyclone Yes can draw the monsoon winds and moisture to the North Bay, resulting in an early onset over that region, said Roxy Matthew Call a climate scientist at the Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology, IITM, Pune. Cyclone Yes formed on central Bay of Bengal in the early hours on May 24. It is predicted to make landfall between Imperita in Odisha and Sagar Islands in West Bengal on May 26 as a very severe cyclone. Cyclones Amphan and Nisarg helped pull the trough last year and made the onset on time, which was originally predicted for June 5. This year, Cyclone Yas may have a similar influence, said Raghu Murtagud, a climate scientist at the University of Maryland. Monsoon onset over Kerala does not indicate the monsoon's progress over the entire country, said Elena Suravyutkina, a climate scientist at the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research, Germany, and a principal researcher at Space Research Institute of Russian Academy of Sciences in Moscow, Russia. She added, Cyclone Toktai definitely affected the beginning of the monsoon. However, such a strong pre-monsoon rainfall usually destroys well-organized monsoon system and result in late monsoon advance. The monsoon rains might arrive over central India by the end of June, which is two weeks later than the normal onset date of mid-June over the region, Suravyutkina predicted. 
She also forecast that the season might begin in Telangana between June 24 and July 2. The normal onset for the region is on June 10. The rains might finally reach Delhi between July 11 and July 19, more than two weeks later than the normal date of June 27. Her reason for the prediction of a late onset, during April 2021, there was a high atmospheric pressure area over western Siberia, resulting in higher than normal temperatures over the region. This led to outbreaks of cold polar air westward from this high pressure area and resulted in lower than normal temperatures in a large area from Iceland to the Mediterranean and Black Seas. Air temperatures were also below average over eastern Siberia, China, and most of the tropical and subtropical part of the eastern Pacific Ocean. In northern Pakistan and northern and central India, temperatures were about 3-4 degrees Celsius lower than average. I expect that this temperature tendency will remain during the beginning of the monsoon. If so, it disorganizes the onset of monsoon, alternating premature rainfall and dry spells and leading to a delayed monsoon onset over central India regions, said Suravyutkina. Cyclone Yas, fishing vessels return to shore as Odisha ramps up preparation. Special cyclone shelters are being set up for evacuees who test positive for COVID-19. Cyclone Yas, fishing vessels return to shore in Odisha as state ramps up surveillance. Photo, Ashish Senopti. Seafaring fishers in Odisha returned to the shore in large numbers and anchored their vessels at the harbors and jetties May 21, 2021, following warnings for Cyclone Yas. The cyclone is predicted to strike the eastern state's coast on the morning of March 26, 2021, according to the India Meteorology Department, IMD. Basant Dash, Joint Director, Marine, of the state's fisheries department, said. Many boats have already returned from the sea. Only those boats that ventured into the sea just a few days ago are still on their way. We are using loudspeakers to warn fishers against venturing into the sea. Action will be taken against those ignoring adverse weather warnings. The days of work lost will cost the fishing community dearly, locals shared. We depend on the sea for our daily earnings. The imminent cyclone has stopped us from venturing into the sea. We expect bad weather in this region but the continuous low pressure in the sea ruined our lives, said Ajya Das, a fisher from Batire village in Kendrapara district. Multi-purpose cyclone shelters are being readied to accommodate evacuees in case of emergencies. Pradeep Kumar Jena, Special Relief Commissioner of Bhubaneshwar, said. We decided to convert the schools and colleges in the seaside villages into temporary cyclone shelters to ensure social distancing norms can be followed. People being evacuated will first be made to undergo a rapid antigen test. Those testing positive will be taken to special cyclone shelters that will function as temporary medical camps. IMD has predicted a likely formation of a low-pressure area over east-central Bay of Bengal and adjoining North Andaman Sea around May 23. It is likely to intensify gradually into a cyclonic storm and may touch the coastal pockets of Odisha and West Bengal. The Indian Coast Guard, ICG, is closely monitoring the weather development and has initiated preventive measures. Coast Guard Dorniers and ships at sea are constantly alerting fishers operating close to coast and those at sea about the cyclonic storm, said an official of ICG at Paradup. The government four years back built 122 early warning dissemination system towers at the seaside villages of the state to provide cyclone and tsunami warning to the villagers of the coastal pockets. The sound emanating from the towers can be heard in localities up to a radius of 1.5 kilometers, said Kamal Lakan Mishra, executive director of Odisha State Disaster Management Authority and additional commissioner of relief. The state government has alerted 12 districts for the cyclonic storm, said Jenna after attending a high-level meeting on May 20. The authorities are working with local Sarapanchas and other Panchayat body members to help people prepare for the cyclone in the seaside villages of the state, said Jenna. Veteran environmentalist Sundarlal Bahuguna dies of COVID. Sundarlal Bahuguna, the eminent Gandhian environmentalist and leader of the Chipko and Terry Dam movements, leaves behind a legacy that will be difficult to live up to. Veteran environmentalist and architect of the Chipko movement Sundarlal Bahuguna died May 21, 2021, Press Trust of India reported. He had been admitted to the All India Institute of Medical Sciences in Rishikesh, Uttarakhand after having contracted the novel coronavirus disease, COVID-19. Bahuguna was one of the leaders of the Chipko movement, fighting for the preservation of forests in the Himalayas.
Chipko means embrace or tree huggers and this vast movement was a decentralist one with many leaders usually being village women. Often, they would chain themselves to trees so that loggers could not cut down forests. These actions slowed down the destruction, but more importantly they brought deforestation to the public's attention. From 1981 to 1983, Sundarlal Bahuguna led a 5,000-kilometer march across the Himalayas, ending with a meeting with late Prime Minister Indira Gandhi, who then passed legislation to protect some areas of the Himalayan forests from tree felling. Sundarlal Bahuguna was also a leader in the movement to oppose the Terry Dam project and in defending India's rivers. He also worked for women's rights and the rights of the poor. His methods were Gandhian, making use of peaceful resistance and non-violence. The Chipko movement received the 1987 Right Livelihood Award, also referred to as the Alternative Nobel Prize, for its dedication to the conservation, restoration and ecologically sound use of India's natural resources. Cyclone Yas, Bengal to double number of disaster shelters to avoid COVID-19 spread. Cyclone Yas is predicted to strike Bengal, which is recording 20,000 COVID-19 cases daily, on May 26. Cyclone Yas, Bengal doubles relief shelters to avoid COVID-19 spread. A scene from a Kolkata street after the Cyclone Amphan in 2020. A scene from a Kolkata street after the Cyclone Amphan in 2020. West Bengal is planning to at least double the number of disaster shelters in its south districts, which may bear the biggest brunt of the upcoming cyclone yes, to minimize the risk of contagion, said a state government official. The cyclone is expected to strike the coasts of West Bengal and Odisha on May 26 morning, India Meteorology Department, IMD, Kolkata said Thursday. West Bengal is recording close to 20,000 cases of the novel coronavirus disease, COVID-19, per day at present, according to state health bulletins. Some of the areas at high risk of devastation by the cyclone are also those with the biggest case burden. These include, Kolkata, South 24 Paraganis, North 24 Paraganis, and East Midnapur. Senior officials of these districts and adjoining areas have been put on alert. The state and district level bodies met several times since Wednesday to brace for a May cyclone amid the pandemic the second year in a row. We should combat this cyclone, if it comes, in the manner we did during Cyclone Amphan last year, said Chief Minister Mamta Banerjee during an emergency meeting. She asked district officials to evacuate people as required but also use masks and sanitizers throughout the relief work, and keep shelters sanitized. Send sanitizers and masks beforehand, if required. Guidelines chalked out during the meeting include Asking fishermen not to venture into sea and directing return of those who have already ventured out by May 23rd. Deploying helicopters to locate people who are straying. Keeping watch on traditionally vulnerable pockets, especially once a possible landfall site is identified. District Magistrate of South 24 Paraganis, P. Olganathan, asked senior officials Wednesday to swing into action and plug weak points. The Sunderban Delta in the district faced the harshest impacts of past cyclones like Ayla, 2009, Bulbul, 2019, and Amphan, 2020. The District Irrigation Department was asked to strengthen vulnerable embankments, plan for evacuation and quick repair of possible damages. Ulganathan told Down to Earth. We have decided to keep less than 50 percent of the usual number of people in the shelters keeping the pandemic and COVID-19 protocols in mind. We have added 250 shelters in the district to the existing 115. Close to 300,000 people might have to be evacuated to these shelters like during Amphan. The disaster shelters will also be equipped with oxygen and medical support as much as possible, the official added. The caseload in the district is also much higher, 8,197, than during Cyclone Amphan last year, 66. But we are well prepared for the situation through constant coordination, said Benkeem Hajra, Union Minister of State for Sundarban Affairs and Development. Amphan like intensification. A low pressure area is very likely to form over North Andaman Sea and adjoining east central Bay of Bengal around May 22, said IMD. It is predicted to intensify into a cyclonic storm by May 24, before striking on May 26 morning, said GK Das, IMD regional head on Thursday. He added it was too early to pinpoint a landfall point and wind speeds of Cyclone Yas. But Sunita Devi, a cyclone specialist at IMD, 
did not rule out cyclone amphin like intensification. She, however, added that the fast speed at which the storm system is moving at present would restrict intensification. The cyclone may also move towards the Sundarbans in Bangladesh and cause significant damage, said Bangladesh weather expert Abdur Rahman Khan, although it is too early to confirm. Cyclone Amphan and Cyclone Bulbul had both entered Bangladesh after hitting the Indian Sundarbans. Cyclone Taktai shows why North Indian Ocean is now wacky. Cyclone Taktai's pace of intensification and the duration of its roar were unexpected. How Taktai continues the trend of unpredictable cyclones on the North Indian Ocean. Photo, Parthusarthi route slash Twitter. A storm-battered street in Goa during Cyclone Taktai's rampage. Photo, Parthusarthi route slash Twitter a storm-battered street in Goa during Cyclone Taktai's rampage. Photo, Parthusarthi route slash Twitter. Heavy showers and continuous drizzle since the afternoon of May 19, 2021 brought down the temperature of Delhi 16 degrees below normal to 23.8 degrees Celsius, one of the lowest in the century. The rains were brought in by the confluence of two weather systems over the North Indian plains that met after traveling thousands of kilometers from different directions, according to a press release from the India Meteorological Department, IMD. The first of these systems was a western disturbance that traveled from the Mediterranean region over Iran, Afghanistan, and Pakistan to reach Jammu and Kashmir. The second was a remnant depression of Cyclone Taktai that traveled from the southeastern Arabian Sea near the Lakshadweep area and lay as low pressure area over Agra and Uttar Pradesh in the morning of May 20. The interaction of the two storm systems, along with moisture incursion from the Arabian Sea, caused widespread rainfall throughout northern, northwestern, and central India. Apart from its long journey over ocean and land, Cyclone Taktai held many surprises. It was only the third May cyclone to make landfall in Gujarat. The first was in 1900 and the second in 1976. It is likely that Cyclone Taktai is the first extremely severe cyclone, 166 to 220 km per hour to reach very close to Mumbai in the last 130 years, according to IMD Cyclone e Atlas, said Roxy Matthew Call, a climate scientist at the Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology, IITM, Pune. Intensification rapid and sustained. Talk time made landfall along Gujarat's Saurashtra coast around 20 km northeast of Dai late evening on May 17, leaving a trail of destruction in the other four states on the country's western coast. It decreased in intensity immediately but much more slowly than expected. Usually cyclones dissipate very quickly after making landfall due to friction and also because warm, moist air supply from the oceans are cut off, said Call. Taktai, however, maintained the cyclone status for 16 to 18 hours after landfall. It did not stop there. Its impact is reaching neighboring states and countries in the form of winds and rainfall, he added. The India Meteorological Department IMD, had predicted that before landfall, Taktai would decrease in intensity from an extremely severe cyclone, 166 to 220 kmph wind speeds, to a very severe cyclone, 118 to 165 kmph. But it remained an extremely severe cyclone with wind speeds of up to 170 kmph and occasional gusts of up to 185 kmph, according to IMD. Such an event happening on the Gujarat coast is very rare, according to Call. Cyclone Taktai followed the trend of unusual and unpredictable cyclones since Cyclone Akai in 2017 and underwent rapid intensification, making it difficult to forecast its severity. Taktai intensified from a depression to severe cyclone in two days which is a new record. Previously, cyclones took four or five days, said Raghu Murtagud, a climate scientist at the University of Maryland. He added. But the real indicator of its uniqueness is that the cyclone remained strong and stalled after hitting land. This was because of the warm ocean and the desert outflow from the excessive heating in neighboring countries of Iran, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. These conditions were also responsible for the recent string of cloud bursts in Uttarakhand. Cyclones are enormous storm systems that are fueled by moisture from warm ocean water. When they find warmer than usual pockets of ocean water, they intensify rapidly, making them difficult to be forecast with accuracy. Rapid intensification is defined as an increase in maximum sustained winds by at least 55 kmph in a 24-hour period. 
Such acceleration can only come with a rapid drop in the pressure in the eye of the cyclone, said Murtagud. This is what happened in the case of Cyclone Akai in 2017 which claimed over 200 lives in Tamil Nadu and Kerala. It had picked up water vapor over the sea between Sri Lanka and Kanyakumari, and rapidly intensified from a depression into a cyclone in a span of 13 hours. A similar phenomenon was also at play in two cyclones in 2018 that hit the Indian mainland very severe cyclone Titli and severe cyclone Gaja the IMD observed. Both caused considerable damage in Odisha and Tamil Nadu, respectively. Many more cyclones after them, like the extremely severe cyclone Fani in 2019, the super cyclone Amphan and very severe cyclone Nivar in 2020, have experienced rapid intensification. Cyclone Amphan grew to become the strongest ever recorded in the Bay of Bengal. Another factor in cyclone formation and rapid intensification is the Madden Julian Oscillation, MJO, which is the major fluctuation in tropical weather on weekly to monthly time scales. It can be characterized as an eastward moving pulse of cloud and rainfall near the equator that typically recurs every 30 to 60 days, according to the Bureau of Meteorology of the Australian Government. Its impact was observed and later studied in both cyclones Akai and Fanny. Role of Global Warming Cyclones are likely to become deadlier due to ocean surface warming and impact of human-induced climate change. Recent research papers have found clinching evidence for the correlation between rapid intensification of cyclones, their increased intensity in warming ocean waters even in usually cooler waters like the Arabian Sea. Five of the eight cyclones that affected India in 2019 were in the Arabian Sea. Normally, the region undergoes only one cyclone in a single year. This, equals the previous record of 1902 for the highest frequency of cyclones over the Arabian Sea, said IMD in its statement on climate of India during 2019. In 2020, two out the five cyclones that were formed in the Arabian Sea. Both those cyclones were severe. The North Indian Ocean region is exposed to 6% of the world's cyclones, according to a December 2020 preprint paper submitted by Kal and Vineet Singh of IITM in Atmospheric and Oceanic Physics. It found that sea surface temperatures, SST, prior to cyclones in the Arabian Sea are 1.2 to 1.4 degrees Celsius higher in the recent decades, compared to SSDs four decades ago. The report said, Recent studies show that rapid warming in the North Indian Ocean associated with global ocean warming enhances the heat flux from the ocean to the atmosphere, and is fueling a rapid intensification of these cyclones. During Cyclone Amphan, which underwent rapid intensification, SSDs were around 32 to 33 degrees Celsius one of the highest ever recorded. Circular ocean currents similar to whirlpools, known as eddies, also play a role in the intensification of cyclones, the paper observed. These eddies could be generated by winds or by density differences of ocean waters. The frequency of very severe cyclones also increased in the Indian Ocean region by one per decade in the last two decades, according to assessment of climate change over the Indian region published by the Union Ministry of Earth Sciences on June 17, 2020. This is despite a decrease in overall frequency of cyclones in the latter half of last century and the first two decades of 21st century. Odisha braces for cyclone Yas amid COVID-19 crisis. The eastern state will witness a pre-monsoon cyclone for the third year in a row. Odisha braces for cyclone Yas likely to strike on May 26. Photo, Ashish Senopti. Odisha has started preparing for the possible cyclonic storm, Yas, expected to turn the Bay of Bengal volatile within days, even amid the raging second wave of the novel coronavirus disease, COVID-19, pandemic. A low-pressure area is likely to form over North Andaman Sea and adjoining East Central Bay of Bengal around May 22, the India Meteorological Department, IMD, informed May 19. The depression will likely intensify into a cyclone and move northwestwards, entering West Bengal and Odisha on May 26. The IMD asked fishermen who are out in the sea to return to safer places by May 23. A round-the-clock control room has been made operational at the Odisha State Disaster Management Authority, OSDMA, office in Bhubaneshwar. Kamal Lakhan Mishra, executive director of OSDMA and additional commissioner of relief, the government of Odisha, said. District officials in Balasur, Budruk, Jagat Singhpur, and Kendrapara are on high alert. District collectors have been told to take all necessary measures to deal with the situation. 
Over 800 flood and cyclone shelters in the coastal pockets have been readied to house people from seaside villages, he added. Additionally, schools, colleges and government office buildings, which are lying vacant, will also be used as shelters for evacuees when relief operations need to be ramped up. This will ensure there is enough space for social distancing to avoid contagion, Mishra added. Last year, 80 such shelters were turned into COVID-19 facilities, before warnings were sounded for Cyclone Amphan. This time they have kept the treatment centers separate from the disaster relief shelters although the state is witnessing a devastating second wave of the pandemic. Odisha has been adding around 10,000 cases daily over the last fortnight, according to COVID19India.org, a private COVID-19 dashboard that aggregates data from official state bulletins. The daily additions are almost three times of those witnessed during last year's peak. We directed the district collectors to maintain social distancing norms at every shelter with the help of locals. Masks and sanitizers will be provided to the evacuees in all the shelters, added Mishra. The state is well prepared and the cyclone is not likely to disrupt COVID-19 containment operations, he added. Eight years ago, Ozma, Odisha State Disaster Mitigation Authority, had identified 328 villages situated within 1.5 kilometers of the coastline in six coastal districts as tsunami-prone. Of them, 64 are in Kendrapara, 28 in Jagat Singhpur, 88 in Puri, 44 in Ganjam, 63 in Balasur, 41 in Budruk. We have trained coastal communities on how to react when tsunami and cyclone warnings are issued, added Mishra. Mock drills to cope with cyclone, tsunami, and flood drills are conducted in the state every year. They increased preparedness, evaluated response capabilities and improved coordination among all the government and non-government agencies. It is now easy for us to evacuate people to safer places, Mishra said. Odisha Coast faced pre-monsoon cyclones, occurring between April and May, only 14 times since 1804, said Umacharan Mohanty former professor of Center for Atmospheric Sciences, Indian Institute of Technology, IIT, New Delhi. The eastern state will witness a pre-monsoon cyclone for the third year in a row, after Amphan in May 2020 and Fani in May 2019, said H.R. Biswas, director of Meteorological Center, Bhubaneshwar. The sea surface temperatures are around 31 degrees Celsius, degree C, over the Bay of Bengal at present. The sea surface temperature is above normal by 1 to 2 degrees Celsius, both over the Arabian Sea and the Bay of Bengal making conditions favorable for the development of a cyclone, added Biswas. Yes is most likely a result of climate change and global warming. Climate change due to natural causes could have a profound effect on cyclone tracks, said Mohanty. COVID-19 effect, public concerns about environment have risen. There was an increase of 16% in the numbers of people concerned about loss of biodiversity from 2016 to 2020, described by experts as eco-wakening. There has been a dramatic increase in the number of people concerned about the environment in the past five years, especially after the novel coronavirus disease, COVID-19, pandemic was declared, according to a new research by the Economist Intelligence Unit, EIU. The research by EIU, commissioned by the World Wildlife Fund, WWF, showed a 16 percent rise in public concern over nature and biodiversity loss in the past five years, 2016 to 2020. People, especially in developing economies, were becoming increasingly aware of the planetary crisis, according to a press statement by WWF. The organization termed this change in behavior as eco-wakening. The research showed a 65% increase in digital activism. Various influencers and organizations such as the Pope of the Roman Catholic Church, the BBC, the New York Times, etc. had voiced their concern over declining nature. Their combined social media reach equaled nearly a billion people worldwide. Twitter mentions over nature and biodiversity increased to 50 million from 30 million in the last four years. Even in a developing country like India, the volume of such tweets surged by a staggering 550% or 1.5 million tweets in 2020, from just 232,020 in 2016. Changes in consumers' purchasing habits was also forcing big corporations to respond to eco-wakening and sustainability, according to the research. This was manifested in a steep 71% rise in online searches for sustainable goods. 
This trend for sustainability was not just restricted to developed countries but was true for developing countries as well, the WWF statement said. People in Asian countries were increasingly searching more about nature and related topics. This surge was driven by countries like India and Indonesia, with 190% and 53% increases in popular searches over nature respectively. News coverage regarding loss of nature and biodiversity had also increased by 26% according to the research. Some 90% of Indians who were surveyed by the researchers, were concerned about the loss of animal and plant species. The Maharashtra government had pledged to declare Mumbai's RAE colony as a reserved forest in October 2020, after social media campaigns and protests by environmental activists. More people across the world now think of loss of nature as a serious problem, according to the research. Latin Americans seem to be most concerned about the environment, with about 96% of respondents considering loss of nature as a serious global problem. Tall waves lash west coast as cyclone Toktai dashes to make landfall in Gujarat. Toktai, the strongest pre-monsoon cyclone in the Arabian Sea since 2010, is also showing some unpredictable characteristics. Cyclone Toktai, strongest pre-monsoon cyclone in a decade, hurtling towards Gujarat. Photo at a underscore taciturnist slash Twitter. Cyclone Toktai is hurtling towards Gujarat coast and is likely to make landfall between Purbandar and Mahuva by the evening of May 17, according to the latest cyclone update from the India Meteorological Department, IMD. Wind speeds during landfall are predicted to be around 155 to 165 km per hour, kmph, with strong gusts of up to 185 kmph. This would be the first time since 1976 and second time since 1900 for a cyclone formed in May to hit Gujarat, according to IMD data. Toktai, the strongest pre-monsoon cyclone in the Arabian Sea since 2010, is also showing some unpredictable characteristics like many other storm systems in the past few years. The storm intensified into an extremely severe cyclone in the early hours of May 17, which had not been forecast by IMD till the afternoon of May 16. Cyclone Toktai, now skirting the Maharashtra coast, undergoes rapid intensification, attaining Category 3 status. Winds are blowing at 185 kmph, according to the Joint Typhoon Warning Center, Roxy Matthew Call, climate scientist at the Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology, IITM, Pune, wrote May 16 on microblogging platform Twitter. By 8.30 am the following morning, the cyclone was situated 150 kilometers west of Mumbai, moving at a speed of 15 kmph. Waves of 3 to 6 meters height is likely to lash the city's coastal areas in adjoining places like Raigad, Ratnagiri, and Sindhujurg throughout May 17, according to data from Indian National Center for Ocean Information Services, NCOI. The wave height along the Gone coast will be around 4.5 meters to 6.4 meters and in various places along the Karnataka coast would be around 3.5 meters to 4.9 meters. The wave heights in Gujarat, where the cyclone is likely to make landfall, are going to be between 1 and 6.9 meters. Amrali, Junagadh, Surat, Purbandar and Bhavnagar will be most affected. Not all the states in Toktai's path are prone to cyclones and might be underprepared. The storm-ravaged places will have to bear the impacts amid a devastating second wave of the novel coronavirus disease, COVID-19, pandemic. Managing two disasters at the same time brings a lot of challenges for the authorities and the general public, Sanjay Srivastava of the Climate Resilient Observing Systems Promotion Council, CROP, a private natural disaster research and development company, told Down to Earth. He added, the administrations of the affected districts are going to be on alert throughout this time because that is where the disaster mitigation gap lies. Maintaining the supply chain of COVID-19 resources will prove to be a daunting task during heavy rainfall, coastal inundation and high-velocity winds, he said. In the long run, people will have to be trained to deal with such situations at a more personal and family level, Srivastava highlighted. Family emergency kits, for instance, will need to be kept at hand for use during situations when help cannot reach. One cannot mitigate the impacts of a disaster just based on alerts from IMD or other weather agencies, especially in the time of a pandemic that has made taking action even more difficult, said Giriraj Amranath of the International Water Management Institute, IWMI.
based in Colombo, Sri Lanka. In this case, power cuts in hospitals and other health centers due to damage to electricity distribution infrastructure could mean urgent alternatives will have to be provided, he said. Also, failures to maintain hygiene and provide safe drinking water and food to the residents, especially those recovering from COVID-19, will only add to the spread of diseases, Umranath added. A more detailed multi-hazard risk map needs to be prepared and anticipatory action taken accordingly. He gave the example of China, where village clusters have designated storage areas for emergencies like natural calamities, to highlight the role of community in disaster mitigation.